Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is the introduction. We live in an age of monsters and of the body panics they excite. The global economic crisis that broke over the world in 2008 to 2009 certainly gave an exclamation mark to this claim. With Time magazine declaring the zombie the official monster of the recession, while Pride and Prejudice and Zombies rocketed up bestseller lists and seemingly endless numbers of vampire and zombie films and novels flooded the market. As banks collapsed and global corporations wobbled and millions were thrown out of work, pundits talked of zombie banks, zombie economics, zombie capitalism, even a new zombie politics in which the rich devoured the poor. But while zombies took center stage, vampires too made their mark, so to speak, particularly in one American journalist's widely cited declaration that Goldman Sachs, America's most powerful investment bank, resembled a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Having colonized much of mass culture, monsters also infiltrated the discourse of world leaders. We know very well who we are up against, real monsters, proclaimed the president of Ecuador in late 2008 in a stinging attack on the international bank and bondholders who hold his country's debt. Only a few days earlier, Germany's president told interviewers that global financial markets are a monster that must be tamed. Compelling as such proclamations are, they also risk trivial trivializing what is genuinely monstrous about the existential structures of modern life. For modernity's monstrosities do not begin and end with shocking crises of financial markets, however wrenching and dramatic these may be. Instead, the very insidiousness of the capitalist grotesque has to do with, with its invisibility, with, in other words, the ways in which monstrosity become normalized and naturalized via its colonization of the essential fabric of everyday life, beginning with the very texture of corporal experience in the modern world. What is most striking about capitalist monstrosity, in other words, is its elusive everydayness, its apparent seamless integration into the banal and mundane rhythms of quotidian existence. This is why the most salient representations of the capitalist grotesque tend to occur in environments in which bourgeois relations are still experienced as strange and horrifying. In such circumstances, images of vampires and zombies frequently dramatize the profound senses of corporal vulnerability that pervade modern society, most manifestly when commodification invades new spheres of social life. As the following chapters demonstrate, the persistent body panics that run across the history of global capitalism comprise a corporal phenomenology of the bourgeois life world. Throwing light on the troubled relations between human bodies and the operations of the capitalist economy, such panics underline the profound experiential basis for a capitalist monsterology, a study of the monstrous forms of everyday life in a capitalist world system. In what follows, I seek to track several genres of monster stories to explore what they tell us about key symbolic registers in which the experience of capitalist commodification is felt, experienced, and resisted. Yet it is a paradox of our age that monsters are both everywhere and nowhere. Let us begin with the everywhere. No great investigative rigors are required to discover zombies and vampires marauding across movie and television screens or haunting the pages of pulp fiction. Tales of body snatching, of abduction, ritual murder, and organ theft traverse folklore, science fiction, film, video, and print media. As with all such cultural, cultural phenomena, these stories and legends speak to real social practices and to the symbolic registers in which popular anxieties are recorded. After all, organ selling is in fact a growing industry based on commercial clinics that harvest parts like kidneys from, for, from poor people in the global south on behalf of wealthy buyers in the north. 
Here then we have monstrosities of the market enacted in actual exchanges of body parts for money. But the revulsion elicited by such transactions often occludes the much wider range of monstrous experiences, beginning with the everyday sale of our life energies for a wage that define life in capitalist society. And this brings us to the nowhereness of monsters today. For effectively nowhere in the discourse of monstrosity today do we find the naming of capitalism as a monstrous system, one that systematically threatens the integrity of human personhood. Instead, monsters like vampires and zombies move throughout the circuits of cultural exchange largely detached from the system that gives them their life-threatening energies. One purpose of this book is to bring the monsters of the market out of this netherworld by exploring the zones of experience that nurture and sustain them, that provide them the blood and flesh off which they feed. Central to this exploration is the claim that tales of body snatching, vampirism, organ theft, and zombie economics all comprise multiple imaginings of the risks to bodily integrity that inhere in a society in which individual survival requires selling our life energies to people on the market. Body panics are thus, I submit, cultural phenomena endemic to capitalism, part of the phenomenology of bourgeois life. But because liberal ideology typ typically denies these quotidian horrors, apprehensions of the monstrosities of the market tend to find discursive refuge in folklore, literature, video, and film. Once we turn to these media, however, we also realize that monsters of the market operate on each side of body panic as both perpetrators and victims. In the former camp, we have those monstrous beings, vampires, evil doctors, pharmaceutical companies, body snatchers, that capture and dissect bodies and bring their bits to market. In the camp of the victims, we find those disfigured creatures, frequently depicted as zombies, who have been turned into mere bodies, unthinking and exploitable collections of flesh, blood, muscle, and tissue. At its heart, this book is about these monsters of the market and the occult economies they inhabit. In the chapters that follow, I argue that a whole genre of monster tales, both past and present, manifest recurrent anxieties about corporal dismemberment in societies where the commodification of human labor, its purchase and sale on markets, is becoming widespread. In making this argument, my study ranges from popular opposition to anatomists in early modern England, an opposition captured in the poetics of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, to vampire and zombie tales in contemporary sub-Saharan Africa. In so doing, our investigation tracks themes of dissection, mindless labor, and the vampire powers of capital across writers from Shakespeare to Dickens, from Mary Shelley to Ben Okri. And it rereads Karl Marx's Capital as, amongst other things, a mystery narrative that seeks out the hidden spaces in which bodies are injured and maimed by capital. Across all these readings, it shows how and why fears for the integrity of human bodies are so ubiquitous to modern society. Today, Sub-Saharan Africa is the site of some of the most resonant legends of market monstrosity. Ravaged by the forces of globalization, the African subcontinent is rife today with tales of enrichment via cannibalism, vampirism, and extraordinary intercourse between the living and the dead, of paths to private accumulation that pass through, through the mysterious world of the occult. In various parts of the African subcontinent, we encounter tales of magical coins that turn people into laboring zombies, of credit cards that provide instant commodities without registering debt, of enchanted currencies that leave cash, cash registers and return to their owners after every commodity exchange. In Nigeria, newspapers carry reports of passengers on motorcycle taxis who, once helmets are placed on their heads, mysteriously transform into zombies that spew money from their mouths into human ATMs. From Cameroon, Tanzania, South Africa, and elsewhere come stories of witches who, rather than devouring their victims, as in older witchcraft genres, turn them into zombie laborers on invisible plantations in an obscure nocturnal economy. And in all these countries, there is an epidemic of stories of dismemberment and murder for the purpose of harvesting body parts, which can be used in the magic potions that guarantee enrichment, 
or can be sold as commodities for the same purpose. Mainstream social science has a long tradition of characterizing such tales as pre-modern superstitions that refuse to accommodate the disenchantment of society that is integral to modern life. Yet such dismissals enact a mystification, denying as they do the systematic assaults on bodily and physical on bodily and psychic integrity that define the economic infrastructure of modernity, the capitalist market system. And that is why we need disruptive fables of modernity, like those circulating throughout sub-Saharan Africa today. For such tales disturb the naturalization of capitalism, both of its social relations and the senses of property, propriety, and personhood that accompany it. By insisting that something strange, indeed life-threatening, is at work in our world. So normalized has capitalism become in the social sciences, so naturalized its historical unique forms of life, that critical theory requires an armory of defamiliarizing techniques, a set of critical dialectical procedures that throw into relief its fantastic and mysterious processes. Discussing Freudian theory's attempts to unearth concealed mechanisms of psychic repression, Theodore Adorno once intoned that in psychoanalysis only the exaggerations are true. The structures of denial that dominate conscious life in modernity are so habitual, the intellectual and cultural web that normalizes the repression of unconscious desires so intricate that only images with explosive power can break the web of mystification. This is why psychoanalysis, at least in its most genuinely radical version, is compelled to dramatize, to use a metaphorical language, an imagery that shocks the modern mind. And what is true of the psychic conflicts in the life of individuals applies with markedly greater force, where the traumas attendant on the commodification of everyday life are concerned. The feeling of atomization and bondage, which is the phenomenology of the market-based system, has become so normalized, the buying and selling of all imaginable goods and human capacities, including body parts, so routinized that a genuinely critical theory must operate by way of estrangement effects, via procedures that make the everyday appear as it truly is, bizarre, shocking, monstrous. But this means, as I argue across the chapters of this study, that critical theory must be capable of developing a dialectical optics, ways of seeing the unseen. For the essential features of capitalism, as Marx regularly reminded us, are not immediately visible. To be sure, many of their effects can be touched and measured, but the circuits through which capital moves are abstracted ones. We are left to observe things and persons, boxes of commodities, Factories full of machines, workers straining inside the sweatshop, lines of people seeking work or bread. While the elusive power that grows and multiplies through their deployment remains unseen, uncomprehended. This is why critical theory sets out to see the unseen, to chart the cartography of the invisible. Invisible things are not necessarily not there, observes Toni Morrison, and it is the demonic power of such invisible things the unseen operations of capital that at least some fantastic legends seek to map. The fantastic might be a mode peculiarly resonant with the forms of moder modernity, observes China Mayville. After all, straightforward narrative strategies regularly fail to register the reality of the unseen forces of capital. They assume that what is invisible is necessarily not there. But this is to miss the essential, the hidden circuits of capital through which human capacities become things, while things assume human powers, in which markets rise and fall, and in so doing dictate who shall prosper and who starve, in which human organs are offered up to the gods of the market in exchange for food or fuel. The reign of the market shapes conditions of life and death in a zombie economy, argues Henry A. Giroux. And this means that invisible powers, market forces, are at the same time fantastically real. Market forces constitute horrifying aspects of a strange and bewildering force or world that represents itself as normal, natural, unchangeable. For this reason, fantastic genres, be they literary or fol folkloric, can occasionally carry a disruptively critical charge, 
offering a kind of grotesque realism that mimics the absurdity of capitalist modernity, the better to expose it. As the global unleashing of unrestrained market forces intensifies anxieties about the integrity of the body and generates horrifying images of bewitched accumulation of occult forces exploiting zombie labor, critical theory thus needs an alliance with the fantastic. In seizing upon fabulous images of occult capitalism, critical theory ought to read them the way psychoanalysis interprets dreams, as a necessarily coded form of subversive knowledge whose decoding promises radical insights and transformative energies. Mining a popular imaginary populated by vampires, zombies, and malevolent corporations that abduct and dissect people, critical theory needs to construct shock effects that allow us to see the monstrous dislocations at the heart of commodified existence. And because modern bourgeois consciousness was decisively shaped by its colonialist horror over African peoples, and their customs, it is fitting there that our investigation should culminate in chapter three with an interrogation of the poetic knowledge animating fables of monstrosity that emanate today with sub-Saharan sub Africa. Poetic knowledge urged M. A. César, or César, the legendary poet writer political theorist from Martinique, is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge and since liberal bourgeois rationalism pivots on a disdain for bodies, corporal experience, and material practices, it is these that poetic wisdom seeks to capture. What presides over the poem, Césaire continued, is experience as a whole. Yet the great silence of social scientific knowledge concerns the very experiential texture of life in a marketized society, incapable of a dialectical optics that sees the unseen it focuses on the observable measures of output, employment, trade, and gross national product. Meanwhile, the invisible processes of exploitation and unmeasurable experiences of psychic and corporal disintegration are occluded by its investigative lens. Popular folklore, however, occasionally becomes the pervert or preserve of poetic knowledge about what capitalism does to people at the deepest levels of corporal and psychic existence. Rather than being treated as an eccentricity, folklore, as Gramsci insisted, deserves to be studied as a conception of the world and of life. In the chapters that follow, I seek to observe this injunction by attending to a variety of symbolic registers through which people come to know global capitalism as it shapes bodily experience, sensibilities, and, and freedom dreams. Of course, Africa is not the only space of such fol folkloric knowledge. As I demonstrate in chapter one, similar imaginings of monstrosity characterized the rise of capitalism in early modern England and found literary expression in works by Shakespeare, Dickens, and Shelley, amongst others. And such imaginings are no mere relics of the past in the global north, as the explosion of vampire and zombie tales in film, video, and pulp fiction attest. Indeed, the idea that something monstrous is at work in the operations of global capitalism is never far from the surface today, especially amongst social groups for whom intense commodification has not been utterly normalized. Consider two cases of folkloric reactions by indigenous peoples in the Andean region of South America to debt-driven economic crises. In 1982-83, to 83, panic swept parts of Bolivia, where it was said that gringos in cahoots with the country's president had been sent by the World Bank on a mission to extract fat from, pre from peasants in order to repay foreign debts. Later in the decade, rumors circulated in Ayacucho neighborhoods in Peru that children were being abducted by machine-gun-wielding gringos equipped with the instruments for tearing out eyeballs to be sold abroad in order to pay off foreign debts. Here we encounter another potent folk folkloric representation of the threats posed to bodily integrity by the financial circuits of global capitalism. After all, across the course of the 1980s, as neoliberal policies of privatization, wage cutting and structural adjustment were being implemented, a staggering 50 million Latin Americans fell below the poverty line, 
Homelessness, hunger, and malnutrition stalked the continent at the same time that billions were sent to financial institutions in the global north to pay off foreign debts. Rather than pre-modern superstitions, therefore, fantastic depictions of global capitalism as a vampire system that extracts and sells body parts capture something very real about the economic universe we inhabit. In so doing, contemporary fables of monsters of the market remind us of the etymology of the word monster itself, which derives from the Latin monere, to warn. Amongst other things, monsters are warnings, not only of what may happen, but also of what is already happening. Yet, as we have seen, cultures often repress and deny the most profound warnings of monstrous happenings. Monsters of disaster, note two social theorists, are harbingers of things we do not want to face, of catastrophes. At the same time, as psychoanalysis tells us, at the same time as we repress these things, we also crave to know them. Indeed, need to know them if we are to change ourselves and our world. It is in this spirit that I read tales of monstrosity across different times and spaces of global capitalism in an effort to unlock the critical energy lurking within fantastic narratives that interrogate the mysteries surrounding the creation and accumulation of wealth in modern society. And I urge that these fables be deployed as a means of mapping the cryptic transactions of global capital with human bodies that define our age. But this critical strategy is not without its difficulties, precisely because of the ubiquity of monsters today, their proliferation throughout mass culture and cultural theory. Indeed, in cultural studies, a giddy embrace of monstrosity is underway, as monsters are positioned as heroic outsiders, markers of nonconformity and perversity, representing all those marginalized by dominant discourses and social values arguing that monstrous otherness is projected onto those who do not conform to cultural codes and norms. Those, for example, whose language, sexuality, or skin color are different. Postmodern theory tends to celebrate monsters, seeing them as the excluded who bind together dominant or normative identities. I am on the side of the monsters as signifiers of the radical destabilization of the binary processes of identity and difference that devalue otherness writes one theorist. There is certainly something to be learned from such readings of monstrosity. By using tropes of monstrosity to probe constructions of normality, be it with respect to ability, gender, sexual, racial, or ethno-national identity. Such studies often do critical work. However, in merely valorizing the monstrous, postmodernist readings collapse into a kind of one-dimensional thought, rather than seeing the arena of monstrosity as a site of contestation, instead of recognizing that monster images are multi-accentual, the postmodern celebration of the monstrous flattens out a field in which different social accents and values contest one another. Postmodern accounts of monstrosity are thus disabled in two key respects. First, their obsession with identifying binary relations, in this case, self versus other and its plural form, us versus them, tends to lapse into what Hegel called monochromatic formalism, a tedious procedure in which the same conceptual schema is slapped over all phenomena. The social and historical specificity of distinct forms of experience effectively vanishes in the re reduction of all social relations to general categories of us and them. It is true that if I affirm my identity, or that of my country, as white, I embrace an us-them binary that excludes all who are non-white. However, the same is formally true if I passionately embrace an identity as an anti-racist, thereby defining racists as the others against whom I and my companions, say my anti-racist co-thinkers and activists, position ourselves. But in concrete social historical circumstances, needless to say, the two forms of identification operate rather differently. One reinforces racial identities and practices, while the other, at least in principle, challenges them. And this brings us to the second flaw with the postmodern approach. 
The way its universal injunction to be on the side of monsters tends to trivialize real ethical political choices, sometimes dangerously so. It is one thing, after all, to be on the side of monstrous others, like people of color or sexual deviants in the face of political persecution, deviance was in quotation marks, and repression. But it is quite another thing where multinational corporations, racist gangs, or an imperial war machine are the monsters in question. Yet, much postmodern theory, as one highly sympathetic commentator notes, offers us no guidelines for assessing the difference between benign and malignant others. As a result, it evades our legitimate duty to try to distinguish between saints and psychopaths. And this inability to draw socially informed distinctions incapacitates much postmodern theory, leading it less to praxis than paralysis in the face of the actual decisions that must be made on the terrain of real ethical political life. But sim put simply, not all monsters are equal, and this is especially so where the monsters that stalk this book are concerned. It is all very well, and sometimes insightful, to delineate the horrors of the split self, the human subject that projects unpal pal unpalatable aspects of itself onto despised others. But it is something else again to analyze the horrors of a split s society. Yet it is precisely here that crucial aspects of modern horror originate in the painful and traumatic processes through which non-capitalist social bonds are dissolved. Individuals subjected to market forces and impersonal economic relationships created between the dominated and the dominant. In such circumstances, images of monstrosity track the intertwined experiences of corporal fragmentation and social apartheid that characterize modern capitalism. Something is decidedly lacking, therefore, in an approach that cannot differentiate distinct forms of monstrosity and which cannot grasp the ways in which subaltern groups in capitalist society attach images of monstrosity to oppressive powers, not just subversive ones. Lacking a critical theory of capitalism, much of cultural studies is hampered when it comes to explaining the intertwining of monsters with markets and the genuinely traumatic monstrous experiences of subjugation and exploitation that occur when people find themselves subordinated to the market economy. The vampire and Frankenstein's creature constitute the two key monsters that make their literary emergence with industrial capitalism and which continue to haunt the modern imaginary. Products of early 19th century capitalist industrialization in Britain these monsters and the anxieties they register have significant parallels, and as we shall see some critical differences with those prowling sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America today. Frankenstein, I argue in chapter one, is in important measure a story about the monstrous practices of grave robbing, body theft, and dissection, in short about corporal dismemberment, and the resonance of this story owed much to actual phenomena which became points of contestation at the gallows in 18th century London as the urban crowd fought to save the bodies of the hanged from anatomists seeking to procure corpses for dissection. For the British working class, anatomists, surgeons, and resurrectionists were all part of a general conspiracy to degrade and oppress the poor in both life and death through kidnapping, murder, grave robbing, and dissection. But these popular anxieties about body snatching involved more, I submit, than the fear of one's corpse being plundered. With the original accumulation of capital in Britain, principally achieved through dispossessing millions of the poor of their land, huge numbers of people could henceforth survive only by selling their bodily capacities on the labor market. This unprecedented and deeply traumatizing experience was profoundly resented and contested and rescuing the corpses of the poor from those who would claim them as private property in order to chop them up offered a rare victory in the battle to save working class bodies from commodification. It is in this light I contend that we need to read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, arguably the classic fictional account of the body snatching era. Shelley's novel drew upon images of monstrosity that were the stock and trade of the popular culture of the English working class. Part of the genius of Karl Marx is to have intuited something of this plebeian culture 
and to have mobilized it for critical purpose in his monumental analysis of the capitalist system. Numerous commentators have noted Marx's propensity to enlist images of monsters to depict how capitalism operates, describing the way in which it expands by appropriating the unpaid labor of workers. Marx writes that capital is dead labor, which vampire-like uh, lives only by sucking living labor. Elsewhere, he describes capital's werewolf-like hunger for surplus labor and its vampire thirst for the living, living blood of labor. Typically, formulations of this sort are seen as mere rhetorical flourishes. Rarely has their strategic theoretical purpose been divined, nor its connection to the theme of corporal dismemberment. As Marx searched for a means of depicting the actual horrors of capitalism, from child labor to the extermination of North America's indigenous peoples, from the factory system to the slave trade, he reworked the discourse of monstrosity that emerged with the rise of capitalism. Pillaging popular and literary imagination from vampire tales to Goethe's Faust, he cast capitalism as both a modern horror story and a mystery tale each inexplicable outside the language of monstrosity. More than this, one of the absolutely crucial concepts of Marx's capital, that of abstract labor, to be discussed at length in chapter two, pivots on notions of separation and dismemberment. To capital, argues Marx, all workers and the laborers they perform are effectively interchangeable. The distinctive character of workers and their labors matter nothing when commodities enter into competition at the market. Specific goods from bread to blue jeans, computers to cars, count merely as means to accumulate wealth. Similarly, specific acts of production, tailoring, assembling computers, building cars, are in principle all the same process, the production of surplus value. As a result, radically different concrete work processes are reduced to a single standard, commodity producing, profit generating labor. So when Marx claims that capitalism is organized on the basis of abstract labor, he also has the literal sense of the word in mind. To abstract is literary to, literally to separate, detach, cut off, and capitalism abstracts labor and its products from the concrete and specific individuals who perform unique productive acts, treating all work as effectively identical and interchangeable. The capitalist system of production and exchange thereby homogenizes all forms of waged work, reducing them to pure quanta of qualitatively undifferentiated human labor in the abstract. This, as I explained below, is an abstraction that actually happens, a process of real abstraction in a world of universal market exchange governed by money. All of this has important implications where workers are concerned. It means that rather than their own life force, their fundamental human creative energy, workers' laboring power becomes a commodity, a separable and detachable thing that can be sold, handed over to someone else. As a commodity, labor is not seen as integral to human personhood, but instead as something that can be isolated and given to a buyer for a stipulated period of time. In buying laboring power, then, capital takes possession of labor, effectively draining it of its substance as a series of unique and unrepeatable acts tied to specific human personalities. Commodified abstract labor is thus effectively disembodied, detached from the persons who perform it. This detachability of commodified labor allows capitalists to break up and dissect work processes into their component parts, confining individuals to the repetition of a limited number of human movements. As identical and interchangeable units of homogeneous labor power, workers' skills and bodies are dissected, fragmented, cut up into separable pieces, subjected to the direction of an alien force, represented by a legion of supervis supervisors, and embedded in rhythms and processes of work that are increasingly dictated by automatic programs and systems of machinery. 
In analyzing these processes, Marx resorts repeatedly to the language of, mon of monstrosity. Capitalist manufacture mutilates the worker, he writes, turning him into a fragment of himself. Describing capital's appearance in the form of the modern automated workplace where machines dominate workers, he refers to it as a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories, and he denounces its demonic power over living labor. Contrary to a widespread misunderstanding, one of Marx's great insights was to discern that capitalism could not be understood merely in terms of new techniques for producing goods. To think in such terms is to fetishize, to interpret transformations in human social relations as if they simply involved new interrelations amongst things, machines, and commodities. Commodified labor involves a profound and thoroughgoing restructuring of human experience. People's sense of their very bodies, of their capacities and creative energies, of the interrelation of self and things, and of self and others, all of these are utterly transformed by commodification. The capitalist epoch is therefore characterized, writes Marx, by the fact that labor power, in the eyes of the worker himself, takes on the form of a commodity, which is his property. But workers do not submit to this new reality without resistance, because it ruptures established customs, social relations, and senses of personhood. The rise of capitalist labor markets invariably meets with potent opposition. More than this, it inspires amazingly creative efforts by subaltern groups to map just what is happening to the very corporal and social fabric of their lives. African witchcraft tales are, as we shall see, amongst the most vivid contemporary expression of such efforts, and this makes them especially compelling in an age in which capitalism has become as invisible as the air we, bre we breathe. In their insistence that something not quite real is at work within global capitalism, some occult process of exploitation that conceals itself, these tales carry a defetishizing charge. Across these stories, real bodies are implicated and at risk. They perform unseen zombie labor. They are possessed by evil spirits that turn them into money machines. They are dissected for marketable parts. A, hermi a hermeneutics of suspicion animates these folk tales, a mistrust of the self-satisfied narratives of bourgeois culture. And this should come as little surprise at a time when the per capita incomes in sub-Saharan Africa have contracted by fully 25% in the space of a decade, while the continent is bled of hundreds of millions of dollars per day to repay debts to world banks. For all their involvement with witches and spirits, contemporary vampire tales in urban Africa are driven by a materialist impulse to search out the sites where real bodies are at risk. And in seeking out those bodies, African discourses of witchcraft detail the ways in which they are enmeshed in dangerous logics of exploitation and accumulation, nowhere more life-threatening than in sub-Saharan Africa itself. To be sure, as I argue further below, all such tales are multivalent. They are about more than the threats to bodily integrity posed by labor markets in the era of capitalist globalization gender anxiety, colonial histories, memories of slavery, the, de the depredations of an HIV AIDS pandemic. All this and more animates some of these tales. Yet, while these fables of modernity are not producible to existential anxieties associated with mysterious transactions between money and laboring bodies, neither can they be adequately grasped outside these modes of experience. Indeed, as I try to show, they provide crucial symbolic registers in which these experiences are received, handled, and resisted. Moreover, as I show throughout the, cap throughout the chapters that follow, such tales have appeared at a number of compelling moments in the global rise of capitalism and have been reworked in powerful works of literary imagination by the likes of William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Mary Shelley, and, most recently, recently Ben Okri. By reminding us that commodified social relations unleash monstrous forces of death and dismemberment, such literary creations harbor a poetic wisdom we can ill afford to squander. 
as capitalism globalizes war, hunger, and environmental destruction, we would be well advised to heed their warning that monstrous forces prowl our planet. It is the central argument of this book that we need this wisdom, dialectically worked up, not merely to understand the world in which we live, but also to nurture critical resources for remaking it.